The following segment comes from a full SEC preview episode from Running Out the Clock. If you like what you hear in this segment, then be sure and subscribe to the channel so that you can catch all of our SEC previews, including whether or not we think the teams discussed in these previews will do better, worse, or the same this season. <laughs> we do have to switch over to the Bulldogs. We actually have a guest guest on the podcast. <laughs> um, as it turns out, we sent out our field reporter, my brother Adam Craven, to go and speak to my brother Anthony Craven. <laughs> the reason <laughs> Uh, Anthony happens to be the public address announcer for Mississippi State Athletics football and basketball, as well as being the broadcast man uh, for some other Mississippi State sports. Um, and so he has uh, some, you know, some more connections. At the very least, he lives there. He works there. He interacts with people in the department. We're actually going to turn it over to those two for our scouting report on the Mississippi State Bulldogs. We're going to do a little a quick preview of, of the Bulldogs football team coming into the 2018-2019 season. So we're going to ask you a few questions. First of all, Anthony, thank you for, for doing this. Sure. I'm, I'm excited to, uh, to have been ambushed at my own house and forced to record this. Yes, I just so you know, I, uh, I drove two hours up here strictly to record this, and then I'm going to drive straight back. Um, you are committed to your craft. Exactly. To, to helping another one of our brothers uh, with his podcast. It's not even my podcast. Um, so we'll get started. First of all, um, is this the greatest recruiting class in terms of names that you have that you have ever heard? We're going to go just a few examples. Um, we have uh, uh, Quatravius Johnson, mm -hmm. uh, Shamar, S-H apostrophe M-A-R, Shamar Kilby Lane. Yes. To go along with the trend of, of hyphenated uh, double S names. Uh, Isaias Furge, my favorite. Furge is my favorite, too. The Furge. Yes. And, uh, well, this is a, a close second, is, is Jorquarius Spivey, um, which, which sounds like quite a football name. And I have no idea what any of their nicknames are, which their, their nicknames may even be better than their actual given I'm sure they are. Given I'm sure names. they are. I'm going to say yes. I know it's a joke question, but I'm going to say <laughs> yes, that, that just based on the names alone of the athletes, that it's, it's the greatest recruiting class ever. We should start doing that. The recruiting rankings should... should Strictly based. Based on names. Just on the names. Yes. Jorquarius Spivey. Entertainment value. Exactly. Um, okay. So anyway, Joe Moorhead is the, the biggest story of the offseason, coming in, replacing Dan Mullen. Dan's going back to his, his dream job, head coach at Florida. Their mentalities are pretty much polar opposites, in my opinion. Very different. Dan is, is a bit brash, um, and Joe Moorhead is, is Joe Cooley confident. He's, he's very laid back occasionally. Maybe he'll shave that morning. Maybe he'll come and show up with some scruff <laughs> at, the, at, the post con at the press conference. Who knows? What sort of impact does this have as far as like, on the players? It's a great question. Uh, you know, the, I have not heard the players publicly say anything about an impact, positively or negatively. Uh, I, I know that at times players would make comments, and, and I never heard a state player during the time that, that Dan Mullen was the head coach in, in Starkville, you know, say – publicly things that that could have been construed as criticism of Dan Mullen's coaching style sure. or, or the way he treated players. I, I think they they all you know ultimately appreciated him but but he was not an easy guy to play for, especially if you were an offensive player, especially if you were a, a quarterback. Um, he was ultra intense all the time. Uh, you know, even you know, even you know, stretching before practice had to be mm -hmm. the greatest stretching you've ever done <laughs> of your ever. life. Yeah. You know, and and so I think, and I mean, obviously he won, he won a lot of games in Starkville, yeah. so 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 it worked. Uh, Joe Moorhead is is different. I, I even have heard, you know, I've even had a, a a friend of mine who works in the athletic department tell me, you know, so, sometimes I I wonder if he and his coaches are too laid back. 
Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, uh, so, so, so I wondered about yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. That'll be interesting to see how that plays out because in terms of their personality, they they are uh, in in that specific area of their personalities. They uh, they are almost polar opposites. Mm-hmm. I will say when when talking to friends of mine who who work in the uh, support staff and uh, you know in the athletic department that 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 change in personality has been a welcome change. Okay. Uh, he's more personable uh, than than Dan Mullen. Now, does that mean he's a better person than Dan Mullen? No, but 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 Mullen was abrasive mm-hmm. and uh, and. Uh, and and could be a jerk. Yeah, uh, doesn't Jeez. mean doesn't mean he's evil or a bad guy or, or a bad coach. He's he's a good coach, but but he's he, this is style. he's he's a jerk. You yeah. know, and, and, yeah. and at times it's really really difficult to work with him. Uh, and I've heard from multiple people who uh, who work within the athletic department in the support staff that, that it's been a uh, a breath of fresh air. The um, the difference in in personality and in attitude that that Joe Moorhead and his staff uh, bring in. I heard someone. And uh, someone told me uh, a, cu- a couple of months ago that, that Joe Moorhead is the most confident person he's ever met without being cocky. Okay. Uh, I like that. Again, does this mean that he'll win 10 games a year because of that? I, I, have, I have no idea. But, 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 but that is a very – there are certainly more differences in their personalities, Moorhead and Mullen, than there seem to be in their actual X's and O's philosophies. Okay. Philosophy-wise, they seem to be – much closer to one another, offensive than they, minded, right? Right. Then they yeah. are personality wise. When Nick Fitzgerald uh, got injured uh, last year in the Egg Bowl, it Who? was a uh, Nick Fitzgerald. He's our uh, he's our quarterback. Uh, he's a dark horse Heisman candidate as well this year. Uh, when Nick got injured uh, in the Egg Bowl last year, in the first quarter, it was the other side of the ball. It was the defense that that really carried MSU through um, through the bowl matchup against against yes. Louisville. Um, almost all the defensive stars return. You got Jeffrey Simmons, Montez Sweat, uh, Jamal Peters as well. Uh, with a new coordinator and a new, sh- a new uh, scheme, is the defense uh, going to be able to carry the load like an SEC defense needs to? Fantastic question. Uh, it's even with the new coach being an offensive minded guy, a lot of the hype around MSU heading into the season has actually been focused on the defense, and specifically the defensive line. State might actually have the best starting defensive line in, in the SEC. Yeah, I mean, I most people put it up there with Auburn uh, and with Georgia and with Alabama's. Uh, it's, it's really talented, and, and it's deep. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, they've got, you know, throw in. I mean, really, the only guy who's going to be part of too deep up front defensively who's new is going to be Chauncey Rivers, mm-hmm. who everyone says is just as talented yeah. as Sweat and, and Simmons, and would have been just a starter. Crazy. And would have been a starter last year yeah. had he been eligible. Uh, so yeah, that uh, that that's wild to think about. And that was a and, and State's defense was a good defense. Sure, yeah. they, they were an odd defense though. Statistically, just raw numbers wise, they were a top ten, top fifteen defense nationally. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they were not. They were not the most efficient defensive team. Um, teams executed or um, got first downs on third and long situations probably too often, uh, especially in, in big moments. State's red zone defense was not nearly as good uh, numbers-wise as, as their defense in every other situation. So, and, and, and a lot of that had to do with style of play because mm-hmm. State was blitzing the majority of the time regardless of down and distance, regardless of where you were on the field. So if the opposing team had a good quarterback and a good wide receiver core, th- then they could, they could score points on State's defense, maybe without racking up tons of yards, but get you know three or four big plays, and all of a sudden they got twenty eight points on the board. Different philosophy now, moving from Ty Grantham to uh, to Bob Shoop, where Bob Shoop's going to have on almost every single down at least five DBs, if mm-hmm. not six DBs. Uh, now, does that mean he's going to always be in zone coverage? No, not not necessarily. But 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 very rarely will State's corners be left in man coverage on an island. 
uh, to cover the opposing team's best wide receiver when that was almost always the case yeah. last year. And it was either we're going to sack the quarterback or force a turnover or the opposing team's going to score a, first a, 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 you know, a touchdown or, or, or get a first down on a long passing play. Uh, State's front line's really good with um, Mark McLaurin and Jamal Peters. You would think in Bob Shoup's 3-3-5 style that the safeties and the corners would, would – would have a better year in 2018 than they did in in, uh, in 2017. But 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 without question, there's there's a lot of potential on that side of the ball, while also being a lot of questions still on on that side of uh, on that side of the ball. When you look at some of their late season performances, and then obviously with uh, the coaching change. Gotcha. So uh, Nick is back, and he is. He's fully healthy. Yes, he is. Um, Along with uh, some absolute studs at running back. You know, you Ares Williams comes back, uh, poised for a great season. Uh, we saw glimpses of how great Kylan Hill could be last year. He's expected to have um, a great year as well. And now at the at the helm, you have Joe Moorhead, um, who's viewed as, you know, an amazing offensive mind. There are some solid offensive linemen, mm-hmm. um, only losing one starter. And a line that didn't get enough credit, I don't think, for how well they protected the QB last year. An offensive line that 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 really, for the most part, physically manhandled teams the second half of the season. Even, yeah. even Alabama's defensive line oh, yeah. had a very difficult time against State's offensive line. It was a group that got better as the year went on, and uh, and and was dominant in the in the uh, in the bowl game victory over over Louisville. So from a personal standpoint, first, is the line going to be able to replace all SEC Martinez mm-hmm. Rankin? Are the newcomers at wide receiver going to be able to finally break open an offense that has always seemed to lack impact at that position under Mullen? The first question about the offensive line, I, I think, is a question that has not been asked enough mm-hmm. or maybe hasn't been focused on enough. When looking at State's offense, yes, every other offensive lineman is back, but the guy you lost was by far your best, your best guy, and 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 by the end of the season was playing as well as, if not better than any offensive lineman in the entire SEC. Uh, can they replace him with with one guy? No, but because they've got veterans like Elton Jenkins, and and because they've got guys who played a lot of meaningful snaps as backups last year who were also back. The thing that makes State's offensive line potentially really good again is the fact that not only do you have most of the starters back, you've got all the guys who were number two on the depth chart from last year yeah. back. Uh, and so there's lots of depth there, and so I've, I, I expect they're going to be able to fill in um, the holes there left by Martinez Rankin and – it, especially in this new offensive scheme, which is not predicated upon the power running game quite as much as Mullen's offense was. Uh, and I'm sure we'll get, we'll get more into that here in, in, in a little bit. The wide receiver question is the biggest question about this offense. Yeah. I, mean, that, I mean, that's the reason why this offense was really good but not great last year. It's actually shocking that they put up the numbers yeah, they did, it is. considering that uh, Donald Gray was injured for half the season, Malik Deer was injured the entire season, Gabe Miles was injured the entire season. So three of your top five wide receivers last year, including both of your guys who would have been the starters at either slot receiver position, either missed the entire season or missed most of the season or, or half the season last year. So essentially, Fitzgerald was throwing to tight ends and, and running backs. Um, they had to use Keith Mixon as slot receiver, yeah. and, and he, he's actually a running back. Um, and but so, so that's the question mark. Can can guys returning guys like Dedrick Thomas and Jesse Jackson can they take that next step? Uh, can the newcomers uh, Austin Williams, oh, yeah. Big Devon, yeah. Devontae yeah. Jason, Stephen Gidry? Can, can they make an impact early? Uh, I think by the end of the season, all those guys will, assuming if they're relatively healthy, uh, they'll, uh, 
they'll be in in good form and, and, and making an impact. Can they build up enough of a repertoire with Nick Fitzgerald in what's going to be certainly a more pass happy offense? Mm-hmm. Still I mean, not 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 an offense that, that passes the ball, you know, forty times a game, but certainly an offense that's going to pass it at least fifty percent of the time mm-hmm. as opposed to years previous when I mean, even when Dak Prescott was the was the quarterback, State was still not going to pass the ball more than forty yeah. percent uh, of the time uh, during a ball game. So, can the wide receivers get better? If they can get better, then all of a sudden State's offense has, has a, a chance to be maybe the maybe the best overall offense in in, in the uh, Southeastern Conference. Ooh, hot take! Hot take. Um. Moorhead brings an offense that uh, thrives off of using backs like you know Saquon Barkley in multiple ways, and a uh, vertical passing game. Mm-hmm. That is very different than Mullen's approach. Um, Mullen, of course, downhill running, uh, read options, uh, quick wide receiver screens. Does his scheme, does does Moorhead's scheme work with this team? I guess the easy answer is we'll we'll find out. Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. I mean, you you would think that it would uh, for a couple of reasons. One, you mentioned that even going back to his Fordham days, really the focal point of a Joe Moorhead offense is not the quarterback, but a running back or running backs who are multi-dimensional. Uh, and State certainly has that. You've got a returning thousand-yard rusher in the SEC in Eris Williams. Uh, there, there, there are not very many teams in the SEC who are returning uh, a thousand-yard rusher. You've got a young guy in Pilot Hill who showed flashes. I mean, there's a reason why he was not redshirted. Yeah. Uh, I mean, he showed flashes as a freshman uh, of what he can be, and he is more talented than than Williams. I agree with that. Um, and yeah. so there's going to be that. That's going to be interesting to see how they are used because unlike Mullen. Moorhead almost never uses two backs in the backfield simultaneously. Mm-hmm. So will they? So will Hill and Williams actually split time? At, will uh, one at, of them emerge as right, the right. or will yeah. one be the bell cow and the other one comes in as the change of pace guy? Um, but running backs are thrown to a lot in Moorhead's offense. Um, I think because you've got a dual threat quarterback and a stable of quality running backs and a really good offensive line. I think State's offense, because of those three things, would, would I mean, almost any offensive philosophy is going to have success when your O-line is good, your quarterback is good and mm-hmm. dual threat, and your running backs are good and experienced. You can, you can essentially run, you know, a pro-style West Coast offense and, and have success. Uh, the question is... You know, the coaches, the new coaches want Fitzgerald uh, and and Keaton Thompson. You know, it, 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 was, it, was, it was one of those games where, where where both were playing. They want the quarterback to throw the ball or at least have the option to throw the ball on almost every single play. Mm-hmm. That that that's what's going to be the biggest difference, I think, from Mullen yeah. to the Moorhead offense. And I don't know if it's better or not. We'll we'll find mm-hmm. out. But Moorhead has worked into almost every single play call the ability for the quarterback, if he wants to, to to say, I'm going to throw it downfield. Almost never is there just a straight power run called without the option of the quarterback keeping it or the quarterback throwing it downfield. Uh, So how does Nick Fitzgerald and Keaton Thompson adjust to that, especially early Mm -hmm. in the season? In, with, with having that extra freedom, but yet that extra layer of responsibility. Um, and then when they do throw it downfield, who's going to catch the ball? Yeah. I mean, again, yeah. it, it, it goes com- back to that. It comes back yeah. to the wide receivers. Yeah. That was a, that, again, that was the only reason why State's offense was really good but not great last year was the lack of consistent wide receiver play, especially down the field, where Fitzgerald's actually a bit more accurate down the field than he is on some – on some of the intermediate sure. stuff. So, so if there is a guy who emerges who can be that downfield threat, then, uh, that, then yeah, I, I think Joe Moorhead's offense, which is more Chip Kelly 
than it is Urban Meyer or Dan Mullen. I, I, I think Agreed. it'll work. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Back it, real quick. Um. You know, with the running backs, with um, Eris returning, like you said, not many teams have a, a thousand yard rusher coming back. But you got Kylan Hill though, and I think personally that Kylan will emerge as the as the go to as the the better running back. Um, which is fun, which is great, because then you have Harris who can who can come in and and their def- their styles are different. They definitely are different running backs. Now I like well, you know this Anthony, but I mean I, I saw a lot of Kyle Hill and in high school, mm-hmm. and he was the only. He's, I mean he, he's he's from he, he's from just twenty five minutes down the road yeah. from from Starkville in in Columbus, Columbus right? Falcons, and he's the only. They made it to the uh, to the playoffs last year that I I did I would you did play by play called called play by play for them. He is, of course, this is high school, and you're talking about transferring to the SEC West. So there's no, there's really no way you can, um, you know, you can relate the two really. But it's six A Mississippi high school football, and he absolutely carried that entire team. And he's the only, he was he was tremendously fun to watch in high school, and we saw, like you said, glimpses of that still carrying, you know, carrying linemen down the field, and and um, and the speed also to, you know, to beat uh, to beat defensive. You know, players down the line, and everything. So I, I think we'll see Kylan uh, take over as as the main. I think Joe Moorhead and Kylan Hill are going to do some great things. I'm looking forward to that at all uh, a lot. Uh, Anthony, thank you so much for taking time to do this. Real quick though, what's the what you got uh, record wins losses? I mean, I mean, I'm I like a lot of people am am predicting state to probably go nine and three. Okay, yeah, uh, I mean, which they, is huge for they, Anthony to say that they they. I'm sorry. You can no, finish. no, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, they will be underdogs in the sure. in the Auburn and Bama games, more than likely. Uh, and then there's probably going to be one of those swing games that they uh, that they drop. They're just law of averages. But they will be the clear favorites. You know, I mean, at this point, before the year even starts, they will be the clear favorite in in nine of their of their twelve games, which is which in. In the history of of MSU football, that's that's really really rare yeah. to go into a season where you go, you know what? They're going to be they're going to line up and have the better roster in nine of the twelve games mm. they they play, uh, or at least have an equal to equal roster match, yeah. and be at home and have the home field advantage. You know, they will be the favorite uh, in the eyes of most in 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 at least eight or nine of their of their games. So I'm going to go. I'm gonna go uh, nine and three. Okay, I'm, I agree with that. I nine and three as well. Um, pretty much for the, the same reasons, like you said. If they're not, if they're not, you know, you can put the roster side by side against their opponent. If they're not on paper better than that team, they are e- equally matched, and we have the home field advantage against. Yeah. Um, Most of the swing games are are at home. A and M, exactly. Florida. Um, I almost said Auburn, and I don't know if a lot of folks are a lot of folks are putting Auburn in that. I mean, I mean that's a matchup that that, that just favors Auburn at a lot of at a lot of positions. I, I know states at home, but I think the two most important swing games are Florida and A and M, and and those are both in Starkville. And yeah. so and so if if state wins at both of those, then 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 I think nine and three becomes becomes the floor. Yeah, of what, of what they could do, and that's not you know, and that's not too far of a reach because, I mean, if Nick Fitzgerald doesn't get hurt in the Egg Bowl, State probably goes nine and three last exactly. year. Exactly. So yeah. <laughs> it's not not that big of a stretch, uh, you know. And the schedule actually is a little bit easier in twenty eighteen because you trade a road game with Georgia for a home game with Florida. Uh, so now all of a sudden that 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 non Kentucky. Eastern Division game goes from being an almost certain loss to now a game where you're you're going to be at least a slight favorite uh, at home. Now the non-conference schedule gets gets tougher because instead of hosting a, a a rebuilding BYU team, you're at a veteran Kansas State team early in the season. So it probably that'll definitely set the tone. Yeah, so that uh, that probably all shakes out in the in the Washington in terms of conference schedule a little bit easier, non-conference schedule a little more difficult comparing uh, 2017 to a 2018. Awesome. Anthony, thanks again.
enjoyed it. Thanks again for listening to this specific individual team preview. If you want more content like this, be sure to subscribe to Running Out the Clock so you don't miss any more of our SEC previews leading up to this season. You can find the full episode that this comes from by searching for our 2018 SEC preview full episodes. And you'll want to listen to that because we give a verdict at the end of whether or not we feel like the team mentioned will do better, worse, or stay the same. For Running Out the Clock, I'm your friend Joseph Craven. Thanks for listening.